Hi, I'm Alicia from the dizzycook.com and today I am filling you in on part two of my vestibular migraine story. So if you saw part one, I kind of went through my story of getting diagnosed and my journey to find Dr. Bay, who's the dizzy neurologist and my current neurologist for all things vestibular migraine. And today I kind of wanted to talk about my treatment plan and the methods I took to get to 100% days. And I just kind of want to go over migraine remission, what that kind of looks like for me, and also give you some hope that maybe it's not these treatments in particular, but that eventually you can feel better and there it is possible to get to 100% days where you feel totally normal again. And I think that I needed that reassurance because you go into these migraine groups and you see a lot of people still suffering and you don't really see these success stories. And so I kind of want to share my success story and what led me to that and how long it took because a lot of people think this happens overnight and it doesn't. So I'll kind of go through everything I did to find that success and also how long it took me to get there in this YouTube video. So I'll start with my treatment plan from Dr. Bay. And so this included uh, both medications and supplements. And initially when I went into there, I told him, you know, I'm 30 years old. I'm looking to start a family soon. And I was hoping to before this chronic vestibular migraine hit me. And I knew if I was suffering from daily dizziness and all these weird symptoms, like there was no way I could add a pregnancy and a baby to that. So I really wanted to get it under control, but I also needed medications that could be either tolerated during pregnancy or something that I could wean off pretty easily. So this kind of eliminated trying things like Topamax um, and some of the antidepressants, which can be helpful for vestibular migraine. Instead, we went down the path of a beta blocker. So beta blockers have been used for years to prevent migraine. And Timolol is a pretty well-known one. Um, but what was the difference for me was Dr. Bay prescribed me Timolol eye drops. And it's very small studies that used for migraine, um, especially during acute attacks. So what that means is you're using it right when you feel either head pain or dizziness or anything kick up. Maybe you're starting to get a drop attack for vestibular migraine or you're starting to get visual symptoms, you know to immediately apply them and it sh can either help lessen those the severity of symptoms or completely avoid them, which is awesome. So it's shown to be effective in this small study, but not a lot of doctors know about using eye drops or Timolol in eye drop form. They're more familiar with the pill form. But another benefit to it is you can get a smaller amount of medication uh, to help. So it's good for people who are maybe a little leery. Maybe you have a lot of side effects with other medications or you're scared of side effects or you're just looking for something you know, kind of to dip your toe in that water. That's kind of what it was for me. I liked that I could use it every day as a preventative and also as a, an acute treatment. So if I felt a more severe attack coming on. Um, but initially I was just 24 seven so sick that it was just better for me to use it as a preventative. So what we started with two drops, you know, twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. And that was my uh, medication, migraine preventative medication that I started on. Uh, the other medication I took was called Ativan. And this can get kind of controversial um, for some people. I, I did have a lot of anxiety with my attacks. I think it's scary to feel the way vestibular migraine can make you feel, whether it's dropping, whether it's vertigo. I mean, living with that kind of illness can can cause a lot of anxiety. And so uh, it was helpful for that. It was also helpful just as a quick treatment to kind of calm my brain down. And a lot of doctors will explain when you have, uh, when you're in chronic migraine, it's sort of like an electrical storm. 
and you have all these things firing, 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 and adding more to that will just, the idea behind adding in a medication like Ativan um, can just sort of help calm that, calm your vestibular symptoms down as a vestibular suppressant. So I took the lowest dose possible every night before bed and I kind of played around um, with using, oh, I shouldn't say that. I was very strict on what my doctor recommended, which you should be when you take this kind of medication, uh, which when you take any kind of medication, really. Um, but I didn't, I noticed that it, I felt better the next day, but it didn't totally make me feel out of the loop. Uh, later on in my journey, I ended up trying Valium and I found that it would make me groggy the next day, even at a quarter of the lowest dose. So I just told Dr. Bay, like, look, Ativan works best for me. That's kind of what I'll stick with. It makes, I, I don't feel like I'm, uh, you know, feeling kind of weird or woozy the next day or hung over. I kind of got that feeling from taking Valium. So Ativan was the key for me. Uh, but, you know, there, there are certain ones that are approved, and I talk about this a little bit on the dizzycook.com, and there are certain ones that doctors like to avoid because they can be more synonymous with uh, addiction and ha harder to wean off of. I had zero problems weaning off of Ativan over my doctor's schedule. So I just want to kind of say don't be too scared to take it. Just Just know your risks and be careful with it. And it turned out to be a really effective treatment for me. I actually noticed the biggest benefits from taking Ativan right away. Um, but it took me probably about two months to really see a benefit on the Timolol as well. So Ativan was kind of like the quick fix for me, whereas Timolol was like there for the long game. And that's how it should be. Like um, benzos, you know, they shouldn't be used really long term unless your doctor thinks that's a good plan for you. Um, they're kind of there in the short term or, you know, now I can use it for acute attacks. So either to help if I'm traveling and I know that my bucket of triggers is going to be full, I can take one for long flights, especially international flights, and it just helps sort of calm that vestibular symptom is system for me. And make sure that I don't push myself into a really severe attack. So that's that's been helpful for me in that case, um, just taking as needed. I haven't had to take one, gosh, in ye a year maybe? A really long time. So I've come really far over this four years of treatment. Um, but I stayed on the Timolol for about three years until my first pregnancy. And at that point, I was no longer having attacks. I was, I probably hadn't had an attack in months. So I felt like it was, I was kind of ready to wean off and just use it like as an acute treatment if I ever had, you know, any kind of dizziness creep in. So those um, were the medications that I tried. Uh, medications that didn't work for me in the past were meclizine. Uh, I didn't really have success with Benadryl. Some people see success from that. I try to avoid Zofrin for attacks, which can help with uh, nausea, but for me, it actually gives me head pain, which I never get during my vestibular migraine attack, so I know when it's connected to something like that. So these were things that I kind of, that tend to work for other people maybe that didn't really work for me. Uh, we also started me on supplements. So the supplements that Dr. Bay had me begin were magnesium, riboflavin or B2, with same name, uh, CoQ10, and vitamin D. The biggest benefits I saw were from vitamin D and magnesium. And I'll kind of share my journey with magnesium with you. So I originally started with a combination pill called Relief. And back in the time, back in the day, four years ago, they used to have a separate brand that was doing a combination of magnesium, so magnesium citrate and, and oxide combined with CoQ10 and riboflavin. 
So it was in the amounts Dr. Bay had wanted me between 500 and 600 milligrams of magnesium, um, about 400 milligrams, which has what which is what has been studied for riboflavin. And I think it was about 100 milligrams of CoQ10. So I was taking that at the time, but it was also giving me some digestive issues. And when I researched all of this, I realized that certain types of magnesium can actually be used for constipation. Actually, that's what they're meant for. So a lot of doctors like to prescribe magnesium oxide because that was what was used and successful in these migraine studies about using magnesium for migraine prevention. Um, it's also widely available, but it's not the most bioavailable, which means it's not the most readily absorbed form of magnesium. So what I ended up doing and I actually had to do this because MIG Relief changed their formula and I did not tolerate their new formula well. Um, but what I ended up doing was taking everything separately. So I was taking magnesium glycinate, which is actually really helpful for anxiety. Um, it's supposed to be easier on your digestive system and it's very bioavailable, so readily absorbed. So I switched to about 480 milligrams of that, and I, I really like the Pure Encapsulations brand, which I'll link in my post, but um, very clean brand, no additives in their supplements. So that worked out really well for me. Um, I took that separately with riboflavin. I took a brand called Seeking Health, which had 400 milligrams, and then I was still doing 100 milligrams of CoQ10. Uh, what I ended up adding in after doing a little bit more research, so I struggled a lot with brain fog and cognitive issues. And so I saw that magnesium three and eight was actually used for Alzheimer's patients and gets absorbed directly into your brain. And that's of course where people with migraine need it the most. So I gave it a try and what I found interesting was it really helped with mental clarity and brain fog. Like a lot of times I would struggle with what words to use and I would be sitting there thinking like, oh my gosh, what's the name of the word cup? I, I can't remember that thingy. And with magnesium three and I, I took a brand from Curate Encapsulations called Cognomag. It was like night and day for me and it worked fast. Like <laughs> previously, when I started magnesium supplements, I probably didn't see a benefit for like a month or two, but with Cognomag, it was almost instant. And it's so funny because I've since gotten some of the doctors I work with uh, excited about it. And one doctor I work with in California who reviews some of my posts, he emailed me one time. He was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if this is placebo, but I feel like I've had two cups of coffee and I feel great. So <laughs> It's just interesting. Everyone reacts to it differently, but I think about 80% of my readers have had success with magnesium 3 and 8, especially Cognomag. So highly recommend giving it a try. It is expensive, so I wouldn't recommend, and this is why I like combining it with glycinate, which is much less expensive. So I'll just take two Cognomag in the morning and then I'll take the rest of my glycinate at night. Previously, when I was having attacks every day, I would just take the Cognomag in the morning and I would do glycinate kind of throughout the day to kind of space out that my magnesium intake. Now I can just take it all at night. Um, I don't notice any digestive problems from taking almost 600 milligrams of these two types of magnesium. I've had some readers say that they do. Um, I think it's just important to do a little bit of trial and error and see what works for you. Just because something works really well for me and other people doesn't mean that it's gonna be the case for you. So if you notice that you're having digestive issues with glycinate, you know, maybe switch to theine, threonate or trimalate. I have all these in information, all this information is on my website. So just magnesium was probably one of the best supplement that I took throughout my whole journey. I still take it to this day. I've taken it through pregnancy. 
Um, I'll use the lotion on my feet sometimes. That's another one, good one if you have magnesium causes you a lot of digestive issues. Um, so it's definitely worth a try. Vitamin D, so a lot of people with migraine are actually found to be low in vitamin D. And this is where it kind of differs from magnesium is I think a lot of neurologists, well, I don't know how many, I see this sometimes, but they'll test you for your levels of magnesium and say, oh, you have enough. But they can't really tell because they're not testing what's getting absorbed to your brain. They're just seeing what's absorbed by your body. And really what matters for me, people with migraine is the amount of magnesium that's getting absorbed in your to your brain. So it's kind of inaccurate to do a blood test for magnesium and say, oh, you're not low in it, you don't need it, because people from with migraine can benefit from it. They m might not even be absorbing all of it into, their, into where they need it the most. With vitamin D, your doctor can test and see if you need a supplement and how much you want to supplement. So my levels were pretty low, so we so we did 5,000 IUs um, of vitamin D daily, and this is something that also helped with my energy and mental clarity. Oh, riboflavin I don't take anymore. I took it initially. It's been shown in studies to be helpful for migraine prevention. For me, I took it for about two years until I started having disease-free days, and then stopped and I didn't really notice that it was a huge benefit for me. So I, I kind of quit taking it one last thing, right? But worth a try. And then CoQ10. So I didn't see a huge benefit from it when I was taking it. And this is also because it's really expensive and I was only taking about 100 milligrams a day. What, when I saw the biggest benefit was I switched to ubiquinol, which is a more active form, and I was taking about 300 milligrams a day. This was per my reproductive endocrinologist, and I think Johns Hopkins actually remember, recommends 300 milligrams a day for migraine, but it just seemed like so expensive to try to take. And now I'm realizing, oh, that was silly because I could have gotten so much more benefit from it. But switching to ubiquinol and taking 300 milligrams a day actually has helped me a lot through pregnancy and through trying to conceive and everything when I haven't been able to rely so much on medications. And I've seen a huge difference in like energy levels and just overall feeling better. Um, it also helps a lot with my egg quality for IVF and it helped my husband as well. So if you're struggling with infertility, highly and migraine highly highly recommend also you know it it just goes to show like sometimes you can say oh that supplement didn't work for me when really like you should have been taking more or taking a different type so just something to keep in mind as you go about your journey that's kind of interesting uh, I touched on MIG relief but what they ended up doing was they got rid of the CoQ10 formula and just switched to feverfew and I do not react well to fever few. I think it might be a ragweed issue, but also started triggering headaches for me. So I just decided that wasn't for me and it was just better to take all the pills separately, which um, ended up being for the best in the long run. I also took a daily multivitamin, but um, called Pure Encapsulations 1, but since trying to conceive for like, oh gosh, three, three years, um, I switched to prenatal. So I have information on that in my post. I won't go into details, but, um, there are good, there are good multivitamin brands out there. And I think it's a good thing to add in if you're dealing with migraine. Um, on to, oh, vestibular therapy. So Vestibular therapy, I tried when I was super sick and dizzy all the time. And, you know, like I talked about the electrical storm in your brain. It was like I was pouring gasoline on it. It was just too much for my brain. Like I had to calm it down with supplements and, and medication before I could really see the benefits of vestibular therapy. So I was on... Let's see, timeline here. I was on medications and supplements for 
about six months before I actually started a migraine diet. Maybe I should start going to that really quick. Um, I was looking for other treatments at the time when I was taking supplements and medication. I was feeling better. I was no longer having these severe vertigo attacks, but I was also dizzy every day. Like when I say dizzy, I had brain fog. I felt like that floaty headed feeling, um, just really annoying, distracting, tiring. I mean, that's kind of how I felt. So I wasn't a hundred percent on these medications and supplements. Like definitely not. And this was six months into taking them faithfully. So I knew that there could be something more, but I didn't really want to add in another medication because again, I had my trying to conceive journey. So I was looking into any natural treatment that I could. And uh, what I found was that was probably one of the more effective ones. And the more talked about was a migraine diet. And this heal your headache diet was supported by Johns Hopkins. So I figured, Hey, that's a big institution that's backing this, you know, it must be worthwhile. I started the diet and it, it's of course difficult to follow, but, uh, about two months in, I just wasn't really, I was still dizzy every day. And I think I just expected more from it. So I remember one night I was really frustrated and I went to go try yogurt and this was something I used to eat every day. And when I was dizzy every day, I didn't really notice it had an effect on me. And I had a violent vertigo attack that night and I hadn't had one of those since I had started my medication and supplements. So I knew that, oh my gosh, okay, this diet must be working for me. Either that or yogurt is a huge trigger and you know, surprise, it ended up being a huge trigger for me. So I stuck with the diet another four months. This was about six months total. And that's really when I saw the biggest benefits were between four and six months on the diet. I noticed that I was having, instead of being dizzy all day, I was having dizzy free moments throughout the day. And about eight months in, I noticed that I was either going, I would have a full dizzy free day, which was super exciting. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. Or I would just have passing moments throughout the day and nothing like super severe. So that to me was a good indication that I could start reintroducing foods back in. And it was so interesting to me because I had done other diets before like um, Whole30 thinking I was eating healthy. And I was eating tons of nuts and nuts ended up actually being one of my migraine triggers. But I would have never guessed this had I not eliminated everything because I couldn't see really what was triggering me when I was always triggered. And I was triggered by other things too, like stress and not sleeping well or weather changes. So it was just very difficult to see until I started eliminating some of these food triggers and, and lowering that threshold for myself, um, kind of what was bothering me and what wasn't. So. I know some people totally don't have food triggers, but I also believe that it, it's easier to see once your brain calms down a little bit. And it's really hard to see that without going through a full elimination for a, for a good amount of time. So, you know, I wouldn't have gotten that if I would have only stayed on it for a month. So again, just try to stick with these things long term. Meds, like, look, it took me two months to even see any benefits from that. Supplements, again, a few months to see, really see a benefit from it. This diet, six months, like that's crazy, but it's not an overnight thing. Like you really have to stick with these things and, and trust that they're working. And if you get little glimmers of something improving, like me not having the vertigo attacks anymore and just having the daily dizziness, that's an improvement. So not just throwing out a med because it's not making you 100% right away, but seeing those little improvements, and this can really help to journal. I used to keep a little bit of a journal and it's, it's really easy to track when you're reading that day after day and you can kind of see those small changes that maybe you're not recognizing in the day-to-day. -day. Highly recommend. 
So going back to vestibular therapy, I started incorporating vestibular therapy in to when I was having those dizzy free moments with the diet. And um, I went through a therapist that Dr. Bay had recommended through UT Southwestern who understood vestibular migraine. And we, one of the things she told me that my previous therapist never touched on was we should always return to baseline within an hour of a treatment. So what baseline means is you should always return to feeling um, whatever you, whatever that dizzy level that you started at within an hour of doing these therapy exercises. And if you don't, if you're at a raised level or if you have a more severe symptoms, especially for hours or days after you've done way too much and you need to scale back on those treatments. So this is where working with a good therapist can come in major handy and where I actually saw the most benefits versus trying exercises at home every day with no idea of what I should be looking for and what was making me better and what isn't. So again, avoid the YouTube videos, like work with the qualified therapist, you know, um, that's where you might see the most benefit with it. Other things that I added in on top of vestibular therapy, diet, supplements, and medication was actually massage therapy. And I started with acupuncture hearing that that was really helpful but it wasn't super relaxing for me to lay in the dark with a bunch of needles in me. So where I saw the biggest benefit was finding a therapist who had a lot of different qualifications. So mine actually is certified in, in cupping. She's taken class, she knows gua sha. Um, we do reflexology. We do a little bit of cranial sacral therapy. So. Um, all these little things we incorporate into my appointments and it was really helpful for me because I carry a lot. I think a lot of us with vestibular migraine do this, but we have a lot of pain, you know, kind of in the back of our neck, a lot of tension behind our ears too. I used to get really warm back there um, and almost feel like heat was kind of radiation, probably like inflammation or something. But um, just feel really tense and tight back there. And so uh, I started scheduling bi-weekly appointments, which is expensive, but we worked together on, she would give me a discount if I bought everything in bulk ahead of time. We actually call them the Dizzy Wolf package. Um, if you're in Dallas, highly recommend her. I'll give you her name. Uh, she's incredible, but we worked together on a plan uh, she would actually wrap my head in these thin cloths to kind of make it feel secure because you can get more dizzy after a treatment. Again, it's like vestibular therapy. As long as it calms down after, you're, you're good. But uh, we did that and she also worked with me on like if she would warn me if she was going to raise and lower the table. So finding a therapist you can kind of be honest with if something doesn't feel good, doesn't feel right for you. Um, explaining what triggers you can be really helpful. I did see a chiropractor and I wouldn't say that it make, made or break my treatment, broke, broke my treatment plan. Um, it was helpful and I really do love my chiropractor. I think some chiropractors can over promise and say like they're the answer for all your problems and I don't think if I would have just gone to chiropractic care, I would have gotten better, but I do think it helped along with everything else I was doing. So if you have one you trust and you really enjoy, I think it's a good part of treatment and I would recommend it if you know you, you can work together on things and they're not discouraging you from your neurologist or anything like that. Again, it's, it's a very holistic approach so some of the products that I liked that were easy to get were um, migraine glasses. So FL41 lenses, you'll kind of see recommended a lot. I started off using Axon brand in my workplace and eventually I transitioned to Therospecs, which are a little bit darker. They were really good for like grocery shopping, which can be very triggering for someone with migraine. 
And then also um, now I really like to use Migraine Shield. So I actually have a discount code for this, which I can um, give you if you're interested or it's, it's in my post, but I use those for every day. And what I like about those is they're not tinted. So when I'm editing photos on Dizzy Cook, I'm getting that protection, but without any color distortion. Um, so that's one of the things I really like about Migraine Shields. I like all of these brands. I think that migraine glasses are super <sighs> unique to that person. So like some people love Therospex, some people love Migraine Shields. I probably use Migraine Shields the most just because that's what's most beneficial for me, like working on the computer all day. But at the same time, like I enjoy all three pairs and I wear them for different things. I know that's overkill, but what I recommend is at least ordering them and seeing which one fits your face the best, which ones you like the best, which ones feel the best for you and, and going from there because I can't tell you which ones are the best. You know, you're, you're gonna have to see for yourself. What I do recommend is going with a more credible brand and paying the money for them because they do block a specific amount of light and you want to find a brand that's very honest about that. I see a lot of people order blue light blocking glasses for super cheap on Amazon. And the thing about that is they're, they kind of throw out there which bands of light are bad for your eyes, but they don't say which bands they block. Um, which is a little shady to me, you may be spending money on glasses that are doing nothing for you. So brands like Migraine Shields and their specs are very open and transparent about the amount they block. And that's what you really want to look for is a brand that can be open and honest about that sort of thing and understand why you're paying a little bit more money for those. So um, that's really helpful. A new treatment that I didn't have when I was chronic was called the Ally Lamp, and I was extremely light sensitive. Now, not so much, but I've used it for um, actually th through pregnancy, kind of with increased dizziness and, and symptoms in my first trimester. Now I feel great, but it, it was a little rocky there in the beginning. and. I was on a lot of hormones from doing IVF, so the fact that I even had mild dizziness is incredible. But uh, I use the LA lamp, actually. It, it's, I don't think it decreases dizziness. I know some people say it does. I don't, I don't know about that. But I will say that it's really been beneficial for me for anxiety and nausea, actually, not, which is crazy to me, but struggled a lot with nausea in my first trimester and I noticed that it helped. Um, I know a lot of us deal with a lot of these symptoms with vestibular migraine as well. Um, another positive is it won't bother your eyes. So it's like if you are super light sensitive, especially during a violent attack and you are looking for something, a light to turn on that won't make things worse, I think it's effective for that. So also have a discount code for that on my post as well. Um, some things that weren't super effective for me were essential oils. And I say that very loosely because I still use them to travel. Like I think peppermint oil is really good for head pain or tension in your head. I think lavender is great for relaxation and anxiety and stuff like that. But what I was doing in the past, what I was, as I was reading a cure for my vestibular symptoms and vertigo was, um, I was reading that it was um, frankincense. And so I was diffusing frankincense all around my house and it was doing nothing for me. So I think you just have to temper expectations for that. Um, if someone's gonna sell you all of these things, I, I had a lot of people reach out to me trying to sell me oils when I was chronic and it's just one of those things that just manage your expectations <laughs> for it. Um, another thing that didn't necessarily work for me was, you know, acupuncture was one of those things. I, I found better benefits from my massage therapy appointments, but some people swear by it. so. 
some of these things are really worth trying and seeing if they work for you. And if they do, great, you have a new treatment. If not, you know, you can move on and, and hopefully switch to something better. So everything I think is worth a try. I would have stood on my head if you would have told me it would have worked. Um, exercise. So I, I started incorporating exercise as much as I could. And initially when I was super sick, that looked like just walking down the street to the sidewalk. But as I improved with my diet, with supplements, with medications, that I could do a little bit more. And so my first foray into exercise was actually uh, beginning ballet classes. And what I loved about those, uh, everyone likes to recommend yoga. And I think well, yoga is like so hard for people with vestibular disorders because it's a lot of bending over and standing back up and balancing without anything around you. Nothing against yoga, it can be very relaxing, but it was not a good plan for me. Dr. Bay recommends Tai Chi, which I, I think would have been interesting. I never took class on it, but uh, I think that might be a good alternative to yoga. Um, but what I really liked about beginner ballet is you were getting a lot of good balancing techniques so like standing on your toes and stuff like that but you had a bar to support you and in beginning ballet classes most of it the time spent in class is at the bar so you have something to hold on to and it was also great because the combinations would really help with my cognitive function so I had to you know remember these small combinations and I felt like it was helping a lot with my memory and kind of that brain fog that I had originally had with vestibular migraine, which was kind of one of my last few symptoms to go. So overall for me, this timeline, again, it was about two years before I had disease-free days and they started getting farther and farther apart to the point where um, in that third year, I felt confident to travel. I felt confident to be on boats. I felt confident to, you know, run my own business and start volunteering for all of these vestibular, for vestibular.org and Miles for Migraine and everything. It was really when I hit my stride with my treatment plan. And that was also when I really started getting, you know, we realized we were having issues with fertility. And so I started getting into IVF and stuff like that. Um, so it was really a good time for me. Uh, I was having, you know, dizzy days here and there, like if my trigger load were, were high, was high or that, you know, a storm would come through and I wasn't super strict on my diet or anything like that. But, you know, I had eventually weaned off my medications and what I keep up with to this day is magnesium. I keep up with my magnesium even through pregnancy. I keep up with CoQ10 as long as my um, OB allows it. Uh, and I also keep up with my sleep schedule and hydration, which are two very important parts that are kind of undervalued. Um, mental health was a big, was a big factor for me. And I think that along with vestibular therapy, you have to have therapy for your mind as well, because dealing with a chronic illness can, can really get to you and staying positive and hopeful really has a great effect on your healing overall. And doing things like cognitive behavioral therapy and DBT and visualization, which I have explained all in my post, seeing yourself in those dizzy free moments and everything can have a huge benefit on your mind and just feeling over overall like hey like i can do this this is going to be me one day i'm not going to have dizziness 24 7. i'm not going to have these vertigo attacks i'm going to be able to live my life i'm going to be able to do the things i love again and visualizing that and focusing on that and making small goals, like how am I gonna get there? Doing those small goals can can just bring a lot of joy into your life. And so my small goals were, you know, cooking, walking to the end of the road, um, volunteering, you know, for different organizations like vestibular.org or 
I even looked into helping, you know, a local d dog rescue with just their paperwork or whatever. So um, it can be, I, I struggled a lot because I had lost my job to vestibular migraine. And that was my career for 10 years. And it was devastating for me. And I didn't know who would hire me with this illness when I was struggling and trying to figure out how, what treatments worked and what didn't for me. And so having these little moments of joy and little goals helped me so much. And so don't discount therapy. I mean, my insurance covered it. A lot of like talk space is usually something very easily accessible and a lot of insurances will cover it. So definitely something to look into and not discredit at all. Uh, overall, so I'm four years in now and I have had more dizziness um, that's popped up with IVF treatments and everything like that. But again, for not being on medication, not being able to take Ativan, everything like that. I mean, totally manageable. Um, yeah, it, it stinks sometimes, but for me, like old me four years ago when I was first chronic would have killed to be in this space. So it wasn't something now when I have these moments that just are kind of, I feel a little off balance or whatever. I realize that it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. Um, I've had some more attacks that have come, like one came when I was on a trip to Hawaii with family and I flew back with a stuffy head, which I know is, is not a good thing for me. And, you know, I immediately contacted my neurologist and we got me on a plan. So I was on a steroid taper, um, taking my rescue medications and overall I knocked out that attack in a week. So just being prepared with things that you know help you, knowing that it's not gonna last forever. And also, you know, appreciating how far you've come and what it used to be like versus what it is now is, is totally uh, can bring you so much hope and excitement. And, you know, I would love to say that I'm in remission. And for me, you know, I, I think remission for me personally means that you don't have any symptoms for like a year. And I can't say that I've been there, but I've also been really straining my body. But to I, I hope that my story kind of gives you guys hope because I feel 100% nine days out of 10. So, and that's like no dizziness in the day, nothing. Like I just, hope that you know that you can feel normal again. And yeah, I still have to manage this every day and I still have to be careful not to increase my trigger load, but overall like, oh my gosh, I have my life back. And that to me is everything. So while you do still have to deal with a chronic illness, it doesn't have to be so miserable forever. And Dr. Bay and I talk about this a lot and he says he sees patients go into remission all the time. So whether that means you're in remission, maybe on a migraine medication, maybe you have to stick with the certain medication because it helps you, that's totally valid. And that's what that means for you. You know, for me, I think it's incredible how much I feel normal even without medications and just continuing my supplements and some of these other treatments like using you know, LA and my migraine glasses and stuff like that. So it can be different for all of us and there's no one path for it, but I just wanna let you know that like, it's possible to feel better and this is how I did it. Just don't rush the process. Don't get down on yourself if it's not happening immediately. I mean, to me, I'm four years later, so it's not an overnight thing, but it, it does happen. So I hope you'll join me on the dizzycook.com where I have a lot of this information linked and look forward to our next video.